From the heart of Wayne County, this is Wayne Goldsboro Television, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Today is the 30th of December 2016 and this is Wayne Goldsboro Television. I'm Wayne Alley and it's Friday. We made it to the end of the work week. But not only that, it's the last Friday of the year. Yes, and it's the only one this week. So make the most of it. Enjoy your Friday. It's going to be a beautiful day, a little cooler today. Yeah, mid 40s, something like that today. But uh, over the next several days, you'll see the temperature fluctuating back and forth. It'll be a little warmer than a little cooler. It'll just be all over the place. But uh, no more rain in sight just yet, for a while anyway. For a while anyway. But, you know, I, I did a Wayne Alley thing the other day. The other day and uh, one of my little uh, superstitions, I'm not really a superstitious person, but I, I like to have fun with that sort of thing. But I, something, some, and I won't tell you what it was, but something told me it's actually going to snow in Wayne County within the next <clears throat> 10 to 14 days. Now it may not be anything more than a dusting or it may be two or three or four inches. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea but I just have a feeling we're going to get some kind of frozen precipitation, possibly snow in the next 10 to 14 days. I'm not a meteorologist. I don't even play one on TV. It's just something fun to think about. But think about it. Now let's see, what's today? Today's Friday the 30th, so that would be uh, about the ninth, anywhere, anywhere between now and 10 to 14 days from now. Or let's just say 10 to 14 days from now. In the next two weeks. Okay? Something fun. There you go. Okay. FEMA. Let me tell you about today's program, by the way, first of all. Uh, Wayne County Board of Commission Chairman Bill Pate is going to be with us for Chairman's Corner. The Chairman's Corner will be a feature that we run from time to time here on Wayne Goldsboro Television. And he's going to tell us what, uh, uh, briefly what happened in the last meeting and what's coming up in the next meeting. That's what he's going to be talking about. All right, and he'll be with us today to, to cover that. And uh, the Chairman's Corner will be, as I say, a regular feature on Wayne Goldsboro Television. Looking forward to that as well. And then, after Bill, we have part two of a program we started yesterday. Back in early December, the Wayne County Chamber of Commerce had a, a, a program out at Lane Tree, uh, another one of their hot topics, and this was about education. Education, hot topic education. We're going to play part two for you of that today. All right? And that'll be the final part. Now, back to where we were. FEMA. FEMA Registration Helpline Call Center will close... Saturday evening at 8 o'clock to observe New Year's. They'll reopen Monday morning, January 2nd at 7 a.m. Now, during the closure, a recording will be placed on their 800 line. That's 800-621-FEMA, 1-800-621-FEMA. And that will advise callers of the temporary closure and the normal operating hours and all that. And the closure will also include the, nine, uh, the 711, 711 relay and video relay services. No support specialist will be available during this time period period. However, callers can still check the status of their registration through the automated menu. In other words, press 1 for this, uh, press 2 for that, press... This temporary closure does not affect the internet users, however. They may register or check the status of their registration online at disasterassistance.gov, disasterassistance.gov. Okay. Uh, January 13th, the Malpas Brothers will be at the Paramount Theater. We'll talk more about that a little later on. And we've got successfully growing fruit trees coming up on January 17th at the University of Mount Olive. Dr. Mike Parker of NC State University will be presenting a program on the care and feeding and bathing of fruit trees. Fruit trees, that's right. How to grow them, what to do with them, how to take care of them, how to feed them, and all that stuff. 
That's coming up on the 17th. It's $50 per person, $75 for the entire family. Uh, 6 to 8 p.m. on January 17th, and this will be taking place in Southern Bank Auditorium there at Rafer Hall at the University of Mount Olive on January 17th, and you can call 919-731-1520 to register for that. Or to find, in fact, there's three ways, and I'll tell you how to do that. Okay, 731-1520. We'll only have two segments today, okay? By the way, Pat is a little under the weather. She will be back with us as soon as she's not under the weather. And we wish her a speedy recovery and a happy new year and all that. Okay, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right, today is Friday. This is the last time I'll see you before next year. Anyway, what's special about today? I'm glad you asked today. It's the 30th. Today is Bacon Day. Whoo, who doesn't love bacon? Nobody. Also today is No Interruptions Day. Please, No Interruptions Day. Okay. And it's also Falling Needles Family Fest Day. And I have no idea what that is, but there you go. Now here's today's trivia question. Today's trivia question is as follows. It's about the U.S. It's about the United States of America the greatest nation on earth, the United States of America. It's a kind of a geography kind of a question, a demographic question. Uh, in size now, you know the smallest state is Rhode Island, and the biggest state is Alaska in size. But what about in population? Which state in the U.S. of A. has the fewest number of people? Which state in the U.S. has the smallest population? It's only 50, and it's not Rhode Island, and it's not Alaska. That leaves you 48, and it's not North Carolina, of course. Okay, that's the trivia question for today. I'll have the answer for you coming up next in the uh, next segment of the program, which will be near the end of the program. All right, so stay tuned. Uh, County Commission Chairman Bill Pate is up next, followed by Part 2 of Hot Topic Education next on Wayne Goldsboro Television. <laughs> This is the Chairman's Corner. We want to welcome to the studio the Wayne County Board of Commissioners Chairman. That would be Mr. Bill Pate. Bill, how you doing? Doing great. Good Appreciate you coming in and talking yeah. to us. This is going to be the first of many meetings that we have. Mm -hmm. And we're going to briefly talk about, uh, first of all, we'll start with the, uh, the last commissioner's meeting that was held. Uh, one subject in particular I wanted to ask you about, if you would just quickly go over the, the, uh, the, the software uh, program that's, that was talked about. Spill, the company is called Spillman, and the software um, would replace the software that the OES has, emergency services, right. the sheriff's department, and all the deputies, and it also <coughs> change, you know, and changes the jail's software. So all that software will be replaced or updated? Yes, and okay. you'll have software that talks to each other. Currently what we have is really basically three different systems. If a deputy makes, makes an arrest, they have to come in and do their paperwork. They take them to the magistrate. They have to do their paperwork. And then if they're booked and, and, and put in jail, then the sheriff's department, I mean, the jail has to do another set. So that's three different software three, packages three, right there. Yeah. And the other thing is the, the software package that the sheriff uses currently is called Pistol. The um, maintenance contract, the company will no longer honor any maintenance on that software a year from now, December okay. of next year. All right. So the when we were looking at Spillman, it, you don't just put it all in at one time. It takes uh, nearly a year to put all the modules in to the system. Wow. So the timing, then that's why the timing was, was came up that we needed to talk about That's going to all work out. Um, yeah. It could be some cost savings in the future because, of, of course, a lot less paperwork. And it may be that, that there are some personnel slots that may not be needed. And I'm not trying to run anybody out the door. Don't no. get me wrong. <laughs> and well, we just wait to see how that works out. <laughs> but the um, it, it, and the, by the way, the city of Goldsboro the night before talked about it, and they bought a package which was smaller, which will also talk to ours. So let me understand this: that the system that we have now, uh, they are each its own identity, its own entity. That's right. 
With the new system, we'll be able to communicate between the city, between the new detention center, between the sheriff's office and anybody, uh, the, and the magistrate's office. And the, minis minis the towns and, and the municipalities, the municipalities. If, I can get it, if I can get it out. <laughs> um, so Mount Olive? Yes. And Pikeville and Fremont? The, the, at this time, the, the um, amount of usage by the others, others other than Goldsboro, since they're so large, the county's going to absorb that cost and we'll determine at a later date whether we need to charge them but that right now we're not planning on doing that. So this software will be able to countywide, uh, countywide, and will uh, each uh, uh, municipality and city and uh, law enforcement agency will be able to talk we'll, to each other. They'll be able to look at data in real time. I can, yeah. One could be sitting up here at the courthouse, and the deputies out there at the other end of the county, and they can see the same information at the same time. So that information uh, will go out immediately. Yeah. It's very, you know, in a way, it's kind of similar with, with the North Northwoods project that we did at the Department of Social Services. Okay. They were on an old paper system that yeah. they actually were able to transport files around, and you know, it's it's it was you know it's just I, I called it a horse and buggy system. When horse I and buggy. When I was, yeah. Now they have the Northwoods, and everybody can see the same thing at the same time. You don't have to go hunt down a file. You pull it up on your screen. You yeah. see, it, you see all of it. You know, when I say that the computers will talk to each other, I'm not talking literally speaking yeah. into each other. I'm talking about the computer will identify itself to another computer, and then they'll exchange yeah. information. The computers will. Well, and you saw that there were a lot of questions, and the reason why this is a very expensive package it, it, over time. There's a lot of discussion it'll, it'll, it'll about cost, it. It'll cost like around three million dollars. That's, That's a, a lot. lot of it's a lot of money. A lot of There's money. no question about it. But you've got to look at future savings and the, the, the lives you may save by having this information available so when, you, when a deputy has to make an arrest. So how is this going to work if a deputy uh, pulls the car or goes to a residence? How, how will this uh, help protect the deputy? Well, if he knows who's in that car by the license plate, he can pull, it, pull that up and see if there are any outstanding warrants, what their history is, so he'll know how to approach that particular individual. You mean before he even gets out of his car? That's correct. He knows who's in there, and 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 he knows well, about know the car, so he'll be able to trace and see what you know the history of that person. Okay. Well, that's good because before now they've just had to wait and get out and go check their identification. That's right, and some and that can be dangerous at times. Very dangerous. If you don't know the situation if you're not aware of what your situation is. And of course, I'm sure the sheriff can do a better job explaining that than I can. Well, given the environment we're in in in, in the last couple of years, Bill, uh, it's not safe being law. It never has been safe. But law enforcement has become uh, uh, da extremely dangerous. And the truth is, it's a calling because they certainly certainly don't do it for the money because they're not getting rich no, out there. No, they're and, not. And I, no. I, you know, I commend them and I, I thank them every time I see them for a job well done and, and hope they can also stay. Indeed, safe I do out as there. well. You know, I, I came through a license check the other day, and uh, there was some there was some new people out there, yeah. uh, and they were all out on during the holiday. And uh, checking and checking license and, and working. Yeah. And I told them how much we appreciated what they're doing, and and I hope other people do that yeah. as well. When you see a, an officer, a law enforcement officer, tell them how much you appreciate yeah. what they're doing because they're out there saving lives. And our folks who are at emergency services too. I mean, they're all tied That's in right. with this they were working. system, and um, you know, they when they go out on the ambulance call now. Um, they have to be very careful. There are some sometimes they go on a scene that may be dangerous. That's right. And they need to know that. That's exactly right. And um, so I said it's important. It's yeah. important to have. Um, it's, I, I, I agree it's still a hard yeah. pill to swallow on the cost. But we asked them, there were questions, did you check with other vendors and they had the information there that, uh, that they had done that. And this is a better product. It um, has a, you have a site license. The other ones, if you add users, mm -hmm. Then you have to pay again. Mm -hmm. and this one doesn't require you to do that. You really? can add as many users as you want. Really? Oh, that's great. That, that is that's important. It's almost like you know if you buy some software at your house, if you buy almost like a site license, you can put that software on all your computers and mm -hmm. phones and tablets and that kind of thing right. without an additional cost. Because that adds up. Because we have a lot of sometimes we have a lot of turnover. Yeah. And um, it costs it costs real dollars to do that. It does, and. Uh, what, I think what's really important about this, Bill, is it is a software that can save lives. So you can't put a price on a life. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, that's true. Exactly and, this, right. and, and we're looking down the road. This, this will be with us for a while. It's a, it's a forward-thinking software, and I, I, I think we did the right thing. So we had to, we had to go, go for it. Yeah, we did. No pun intended. We had to bite the bullet and go <laughs> yeah, for it, right? You're exactly right. <laughs> okay. You're exactly right. All right, coming up, we've got a meeting this coming, uh, this coming Tuesday. 
The Board of Commissioners to Wayne County meeting uh, with their agenda briefing at 8 yeah. o'clock and then the regular meeting beginning at 9 o'clock in the Commissioner's re meeting room on the fourth floor of the Wayne County Courthouse. It's going to be a, uh, should be a fairly short meeting. Oh, that's um, good. Matter of fact, I was kidding with, kidding with them in the agenda meeting yesterday. I said, I don't know if we need to be having a meeting right after a holiday because typically you don't have anything to really cover. Um. And we went through the agenda meeting yesterday in about 15 minutes or, really? or less. That's not very um, long. It's just that, you know, everybody was out of place and, and things don't happen as, as they normally do during a holiday season. Right. But um, we're going to be looking at it. You know, we've got a public hearing on it, um, some property in uh, Salsa Township changing it from airport to residential agriculture and um, we got some present use value things to cover they're all in order we'll get through that pretty quickly some, some budget amendments to cover mm -hmm. and then we're going to have um, two presentations from one is from um, Bobby Jones on Coash, and then um, Duke Energy uh, Miller Chalk, she'll be here to represent okay. their, their, their viewpoint. So it'll be, it'll be two opposing sides there talking about coal ash, Bobby John. Well, I don't Miller know Chalk. whether to be opposed or not. We'll, oh, really? Yeah. We'll, okay. You know, we'll, I, I hope that they're, they're perhaps finding a solution that they're all agreeing upon. I'm sure they'll they'll find an agreement somewhere. They'll find well, middle I ground think, somewhere. I think Duke has made a decision they're going to destroy the, uh, or actually burn the coal ash on site. And the, the technology of that is to put, it goes in to concrete that's been used for years rather than, rather, rather than hauling it to a, a, another site somewhere which mm -hmm. you've got problems with if you're going across the road right. and or if you can put on rail cars so I think it's a better solution to uh, it sounds much of, better take care of it on site sounds a lot more efficient yeah. than, than hauling it away so, uh, that, I mean, they, just, they just announced that what a couple of weeks ago yeah. that they were going to do that well that'll be an interesting part of the meeting there yeah but other than that it, I think it's going to be a fairly Probably short meeting. Well, no offense, but I'm glad to hear that, Bill. Yeah. Uh, that's good news. I'm glad we're not spending any more money. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, we'll be there covering it, and we'll invite uh, everybody to attend. Okay. The uh, Wayne County Board of Commissioners meetings are always open to the public, always, and that would be both the uh, briefing, agenda briefing and the meeting itself, starting at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock, respectively. And you can so, live stream it, too, can't you? Yes, we are. We live stream that, as a matter of fact. We do. And if you would like to know how to do that, you go to WayneGov.com. And on that main page of WayneGov.com, you'll find a link to the live stream if you're not able to be here. So everybody's invited. There are a lot of people who do that, by the way. Do they really? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm, to hear I'm, that. I get I get texts all the time while I'm sitting up there. <laughs> do you? <laughs> they're, they're, they're sitting there watching, on, they are watching on their computer and they're texting you at the same time. And I, I appreciate that they're doing that. Well, that, I think that's just great. Well, I appreciate they, you they letting us know about that. Yeah. And we're going to see you again in, uh, in, uh, after the meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. A couple of days after the meeting. And Bill, we appreciate right. it. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill Pate is the chairman of the Wayne County Board of Commissioners, and this has been the Chairman's Corner. Thank you. What a wonderful segue into the third question. What is the role of technology in your institutions? Dr. Kerstetter first, Dr. Walker, and Dr. Dunsmore. Thank you. Well, thank you. Let me put this into perspective. Um, when I was in the dark ages and moving into college for the first time, and the monks helped me move into my dorm room, <laughs> my big piece of technology was I had a clock radio. So that puts it into perspective. And each year, and all the years that I've been in higher education, I watch the new students move in. And what used to come in on a car now comes in with a trailer or a UV, uh, SUV or something along that line. And if you think I don't have any hair, you should see my physical plant director who's watching all this equipment coming in and trying to figure out what the impact on our electrical load is going to be, let alone on other parts of technology. Because truth of the matter is, once the students move in their computers, and their uh, TVs and move in their uh, music equipment and move in all the stuff supporting their cell phone and then they start moving in the luxuries of life, you find it's an entirely different world right now. And we are so remarkably dependent on technology. And you see that happen when a Matthew, Hurricane Matthew comes in and we were safe and sound, but we were also without electricity for a couple days. If you want to see panicky students, look at students who are looking at their cell phone batteries going down and they can't you know, recharge in the, in the residence halls because the power's out. They can do it out in their car, 
but they're running out of gas and none of the gas stations are, uh, are you know, pumping gas at this point. So talk about a panic look. But we made it through that. But it brings back the fact that everything is so incredibly dependent on technology. And I will tell you, whatever I have isn't enough. And whatever you have is going to have a half-life of two years on it. So this is an uphill battle like nobody's business. We spend more than 5% of our budget. We spend several million dollars a year exclusively on technology and technology support. And the way that it, it impacts the institution is I can't think of a single area that is not dependent on technology in some way, shape, or form. You have your, your obvious examples, our computer centers and things like that. But every single course that we have has an electronic shell to it. It's where we keep the syllabus. It's where we do the assignments. It's where you turn in assignments. It's where you show grades. It shows all those different things. Every student has to use that. Every course has that. The good news is when we were out of, out of school because of the storm, it did mean that there were ways that our students and our faculty and the staff could, could communicate electronically, which was great. But even um, dis disciplines that you wouldn't think use technology do in fact use technology. We're re-examining what we're doing in education because we know that we're constantly going to have to be on the leading edge of how do you use technology in the classroom. And there's some incredible opportunities for us on that. But we do know that whatever we need to do, are going to be doing, we need to be able to respond to the expectations that our students have. And that's not just that we have Wi-Fi coverage all over campus, that they can download and watch Netflix at night when they want to relax rather than studying. That's a whole other discussion uh, on things. But we know that it is always going to be an increasing demand on us and that it will be never anything that we think that we can get totally ahead. We are just so remarkably technology dependent right now. And the scary thought, on the other hand, is that the students will adapt to any new technology remarkably quickly. So um, I think that's both the good news and the challenges to us. Um, I'd agree with you, Phil. Every, every experience our student has at our institution is really technology driven from the enrollment process, f from filing your financial aid online, to online students receiving online tutoring, to students utilizing the app to get things done with their application. Every part of that experience, from registering to a course for faculty putting their information out in a virtual environment, for students to get everything at our institution relies on the technology. Uh, the programs themselves, especially the applied technical programs, are very much driven by equipment and technology. We have responsibilities to our creditors about how we house that information. So it's not only a matter of how much computer equipment we're buying. And by the way, we've got 32 labs at our college that have 10 or more computers. And the average lab size is 20 to 30 computers. And those are the ones we just counted this morning. So that number may or may not be accurate, but there's probably more. But now a big issue for us technology-wise is also the security in our technology. And hackers not only hack into Yahoo databases, they hack into colleges and university databases as well. So quite a bit of our budget, and is growing every year, grows around technology either around system security or the hardware involved with networking, the constant software upgrades, and the increasing demands that students bring to campus in terms of the Wi-Fi bandwidth that they require in certain areas of the campus. It's, it's just dramatic. And, and although I had a little more than the clock radio, I'm going to say um, two words that will date some of you. How many of you remember component system? Anybody remember? Oh, not many of those. I that was what I had in my dorm room where you lift the arm up and the record just plays over and over again. <laughs> well, that, that dates me. That's about my level of technological expertise. But by my colleagues are right. It is dramatically impacting everything we do 
the challenge for leadership is there are lots of options. There are lots of choices around technology. And so your, your choice about what you're going to do to both help the learning process but also student support processes, once you go down that rabbit hole, it is a costly rabbit hole if you make a, a, a poor decision around technology. So not only is it, it is it important as a component and as a increasingly larger percentage of our budget, it places a lot of pressure on the leadership and the faculty and staff around making sure that we choose the right technology. Uh, thank you. I had a Texas Instrument calculator that added, subtracted, divided, and multiplied. Um, it's extremely important with our kids. I, I, I walk through the hallways, and, and, and as young as kindergarten kids are carrying smartphones. Primarily as a parent, and I understand this, is that connection. They need to know what's going on. There was a study done last year in uh, Richmond, I believe, that they interviewed homeless folks, and the number one thing that they would not give up was their smartphone or their connectivity is how important that is. So when, when I came in last year, and many of you heard, us, heard me say this, we were about 97th out of the 115 school systems in the state of North Carolina for technology readiness. So the easiest way to explain that is I had a big fire truck hose coming into every one of my buildings and we were hooking a garden hose onto it. And people ask, why don't we go to a one-to-one -one initiative? If we put a computer in every one of our students' hands and turned them on, my buildings would have probably exploded. So we knew we had a real problem. And, and the capital outlay with that is absolutely incredible, as uh, my colleagues said. And so we put a plan together, and we went to our commissioners. We went with Mr. Woods. And they graciously uh, worked with us. And we rolled out a, a five-year plan, and we've already started this year. We'll have our high schools and our middle schools wired that we can handle everybody turning on to our internet or attaching on with their cell phones, so the speed's there. One of our challenges is the state is moving to online testing. We're one of the few systems that can't do that, because A, I don't have a computer for every one of my students, and B, again, we couldn't turn them all on until we had that um, capability in. So we rolled out a plan. We're working with the state and the federal E-rate where we can buy things up front and we get a lot of uh, rebates and, and a very cheap cost. And, and we prioritize that plan. I do want to thank our commissioners and Mr. Woods for supporting that uh, as we move forward with that. One of the things that were challenges with the equipment, um, everybody asks about a one-to-one -one initiative. What I can afford to buy is technically what most schools use are a Chromebook. They're about three or $400, and they get kids online and do what they need to do. They're carrying smartphones around that make those things look obsolete. So when I go in and sit down and talk with the kids, they'll look at me and say, well, Dr. Dunsmore, do you have a smartphone in your pocket? Yes, I do. Why do I have to remember all this stuff when I can just Google the answer? <laughs> Good question. But don't you think you need to learn the basics? Well, we're not talking the basics. I know how to add, multiply, subtract, and divide. But if I forget one of my formulas in an advanced calculus class, why do I need to memorize it? And I can't answer that. And when I sit down with business leaders, and we had uh, some things uh, at the Paramount last year of what they're looking for, um, they don't care what they got as a grade in a class. They want to know, can they do the research? Can they work in groups? And can they sit and adequately communicate what they found and work in those groups? We're going to give them the technology to make that happen, but can they all play together in the sandbox? So what our challenge is, what we're looking at is a BYOD, a bring your own device. They have them. And we're doing some things at the high school, particularly at the uh, lunchtime, you can get on your smartphone. You can text. You can do whatever. It really lowered the sound level in our cafeterias, which is a wonderful thing. We got an awful lot of calls from parents. You want to know why? They're blowing up my data plan <laughs> because they weren't used to that. So where our challenge is coming is we let them onto our, our networks because we have to teach safe usage. We have to teach those students how to adequately use these. And, and, and yes, they're kids. 
They're going to figure out ways to hack around our systems. They're kids. That's what they do. And we need to encourage that, but to do it within certain parameters. The other piece of that is having them charged because they want to plug in everywhere you want to go. So a lot of schools are going if they have charging stations and they're allowing the kids to use their phones, to work with their phones. And there, there's a wonderful world out there. One of the largest educational platforms is YouTube. Good information. We encourage our teachers to use it. We're encouraging our kids to be inquisitive. But we have a real responsibility to teach them appropriate use, acceptable use. And if you're hacking into things, that's great. But you do realize there comes a consequence depending on what you're doing and, and how you're using that. But we listen to what businesses and what our higher ed folks are saying and, and what they want in, in, in the workforce that's going to stay here in Wayne County, is going to pay taxes and raise their families and, and do all those good things. And we're not going to have a traditional school like what probably most of us grew up with. That you come home, and I, I hear oftentimes we're, my, my kids don't have books. Well, back to the state budget, that's a line item. And I can tell you it's been cut by over 80% in the last five years. 80% of my book budget is cut. So, yeah, my books are outdated. They're old and they're worn. But I'll also tell you the companies that make them have to make money. So every year they change the additions. Yeah. You know, you guys know and the colleges know that. Um, so it's not all about technology. But we also have to find that, that mix. Also, I understand as a parent, kids coming home, the classes they're taking, the things that are happening, I really feel for parents. My kids, my, old, my youngest is 26. He'll take my cell phone and he'll say, why aren't you doing this, 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 and this? I said, for God's sakes, don't touch that. <laughs> because I'll walk away and I, I have no idea what he did. <laughs> But I, I watch kids, how they're wired differently now. And, and I'll, I'll, real brief story, I do observations in classrooms. And I, I have a young lady, she was a park scholar. This was prior to me coming here. Went to NC State and she's in their vet school. Real sharp girl, sitting in the back of a biology class. She's got her left hand in a pocket and she's right handed. And I, she's doing something in her pocket taking notes, listening, and I see her pull the cell phone out and look, put it back in her pocket. So she's obviously typing on a cell phone without looking at the display. So after the class, I went up and I said, Chelsea, what, do you have a cell phone in your pocket? Now, principals will tell you, I catch you with a cell phone, I'm gonna take it and you're suspended for five days. That's traditionally what has been done. So she went panicked and I said, you're not in trouble. What were you doing? Well, so-and-so and I have a, a presentation we're doing next period English class and we were finalizing it. I said, what? And she said, yeah, and, and she pulled her cell phone out and showed me. I said, let me see your notebook. She took four pages of notes. I mean, these kids, I, and mine included, you go home at night, they got headsets on, they're looking at a cell phone, they got the TV on, they're typing on the computer, they're wired differently. And, and so our challenge is, how do we get out in front of that, A, pay for it, and, and B, because as a teacher's challenge, in, 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 in Dunsmore's case, they're teaching me when we go into these classes. So education's gonna change radically over the next several years, and, and I think one of our biggest challenges is gonna be our policies and our procedures and how we're teaching the, that usage. Because most of you know, you, you know, just the, the research part on the internet and the, the, the inquisitiveness and what you can look up and research, kids are gonna do it. They have the time to do it. And, and so we doing a lot of work with flipping classrooms. What we call now is you give an assignment and it's go home and do all that research. And then they come back and it's just more of a student led then how they figured all this stuff out and how that messes with our curriculum. And, and it's amazing when you see what these kids are doing. We have kids that are doing computer coding in fourth and fifth grade. And there's programs out there that they can build Tyco robots, sit in the classroom on a computer and program them, have a maze out in the hallway and watch a little computer go through the maze in fourth and fifth grade. Uh, the, these kids are doing incredible things. And I have a two-year-old niece 
that if I go home to see her and she grabs my phone, the first thing she does is start swiping her finger across the screen. She wants to see my pictures. Or what games do you have on that? So I think from an educational standpoint, one of the things that I take very dear in my heart of this transformation of going in, we can't say we're in the 21st century anymore. I mean, they're, they're, you see now they're talking going to Mars and these places that different things are happening. It's the reality. And uh, so that's where if technology for us, because I got 10 under 19,000 kids, and believe me, they're doing things on computers and on their smartphones that just absolutely blow my mind. Thank you. Most businesses or organizations have a product or service that is amazing, but no one knows about it. What is your best kept secret? Dr. Walker, we'll start with you, followed by Dr. Dunsmore and Dr. Kerstetter. Well, thank you. I, I struggle with this one, not because we didn't have a best kept secret. It's just we got so many of them. So I've, I've just given Wayne Community College a new desk. It is the most respected, best known secret in Wayne County. And the reason I say that, I mean, I, I stepped back and, and Phil and I just got back uh, from an accred national, uh, a regional accrediting conference. And it's called SAC, Southern Association for College Schools, and they also accredit K through 12 as well. But you go to conferences like that and just when you think you want to lament something at your institution, you meet some of your colleagues who are uh, across the South and you realize how privileged you are. Last year, Wayne Community College awarded more credentials than they ever have in the history of the institution. Over 800 either associates degrees, certificates, or diplomas. Wayne County was the first certified work-ready community in the state, l largely because of the efforts of people in our basic skills program and working with the career readiness certificates. Just last week, I, I heard that both our, our PN and our ADN nursing programs last class graduate passed their certification exams at 100% rate. Um, just last week, week before last, our, our automotive program, we are, belong to something called the NC3, our automotive technology program, uh, which is responsible for certifications in the automotive industry that have labor market value. And across the United States, there are only 12 faculty members that are designated as train the trainer faculties. Two of them are on our campus. We have some of the best programs in the state. Uh, across the system, the 58 community colleges are evaluated by indicators. Things like licensure, success rate, first year progression, those sorts of things. And I'll be happy to share the report with anyone who wants to look at it. And you can compare us to other community colleges in the state. We are certainly in the top 10 community colleges out of 58 in this state. And I say all that because it's made me sober <laughs> as a new president that I, am, I have really benefited from the sustained leadership that was, has been at Wayne Community College historically. A lot of college presidents don't get consistency of strength of leadership prior to their arrival. Uh, and many, many community college presidents in particular now, it is, uh, there's a large demographic shift and some people don't want to walk into that job because in many institutions you're walking into you're throwing water on a hornet's nest. You're walking into some really challenging situations. I was privileged not to have to do that. So I think one of my roles is to advocate about how effective we have been. Now we still have, as an institution and as a critical thread in the Wayne County community, we still have, for lack of a better term, miles to go before we sleep. But I think we need to acknowledge what a jewel and what a resource Wayne Community College has been. So I'm particularly proud just to be a part of this community now and privileged to work with the faculty and staff and a student body who, who is head, head and shoulders above most campus communities. 
I'll say one last, last fall, our fall to fall retention, meaning that students who were there last fall showed back up this fall was 70%. Now that, that means nothing uh, until I give you context. The national average is 52. Uh, that's your faculty and staff at work at the college. So we are the best known secret in Wayne County. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I, I actually have two things. My first one is uh, Dr. Ed highlighted first. I, I, being relatively new now, I guess I'm over my honeymoon period of my second year, um, but having a board of education and a board of commissioners and a county manager that works together with public education, Mr. West, my board chair is sitting back there here today and the county commissioners that are here and it's, as he said, I, I've never seen or talked to my colleagues that have this type of relationship that truly want what's best for our community, our students and our staff. So so um, I thank them for their listening and it's not a blank check. They don't always say yes. Um, and they challenge us to prioritize and they want to see the results. But I, I do feel we're on the right track. And uh, as I've often said, I think Wayne County Public Schools can be one of the top systems in the state, if not the country. Our hidden gems, our CT program, which kind of ties into what Dr. Walker had said, a lot of time we get caught up in the college ready piece. And as I go out to the, the community college and there's a lot of things that are happening out there in what I call career tech ed. And in public education and high schools, the CTE, the career tech ed piece, our students take a, a, a test called work key. So it's each class, it builds on another. The ultimate goal is a certification, uh, automotive certification, where they would progress on to the community colleges. And most of you know if you take your car to get it fixed, at least in my world, it costs as much as going to the doctor anymore. So these kids are in high demand. Um, we're one of the top school systems in the state of North Carolina on those percentages. In, passing rates on the, our, our work keys. We're about 18% above the state average, which is incredible. But when you look around at our schools, we have one of the best diesel mechanic programs in the state down in Southern Wayne that they just put a huge addition on. We have waiting lists for kids that want to go to that. Charles B. Acock, our automotive program, just was second nationally, in, in, if you saw that in the newspapers. One of the things they get dinged for the eight days we were out of school, they couldn't turn in the projects that they needed to turn into because of Hurricane Matthew. And they still were second in, in what they did. The, the one thing the evaluators told them, they didn't paint the engine when they had it out. Well, they didn't have time. When they got back to school, they had to get the engine back in and make sure it ran. Um, so we have programs going on, uh, the Fire Academy at Goldsboro High School. I think one of the challenges that we face, and as I mentioned earlier with transportation, if I live in the northern end of the county, I don't necessarily be able to go down to the diesel program and how we get equity across all our systems and make that important to all our students. And working with Dr. Walker and looking how that progresses for our kids and getting them lined up because we know for graduation, and Dr. Ed gave those, or Neil gave the statistics earlier, I have to give those kids hope. And anymore, you can't go visit the community college in 11th grade. Um, they told me once, when I first visited, I saw a, a 3D lathe, and they said, Dr. Dunsmore, if you know basic algebra, I think you've told me this, you can program that. Well, we're teaching basic algebra in sixth and seventh grade, and if those kids don't see that till their junior year in high school, I've lost them. So we have to give them hope what's out there. Um, I'm tremendously encouraged. I think that's our best kept secret, and uh, I, I'm, I'm thankful for the support we have and just these the, the people would come to support education because our students are our future and we have some great ones here thank you Phil. there really is no advantage of having a best kept secret it almost <laughs> seems oxymoronic in some respects and so I'm going to change my title from being president of the university to, to cheerleader in chief and 
this isn't about me, it isn't about the institution as much as I want you to realize what a gem you have in Wayne County in the University of Mount Olive, as well as obviously the public school system and your community college. This past year, we've received the, uh, the following accolades. We were 2016-17 College of Distinction, which honors excellence in four distinction areas, engaged students, great teaching, vibrant communities, and successful outcomes. We were maintained, named as a military-friendly school, which only 15% of the schools in the United States get so designated because of our service to uh, the military. We were named by the Washington Monthly's magazine as the best bang for the buck, number one in the southeast region of the United States. And that looks in terms of the ability to help non-wealthy students attain marketable degrees at affordable prices. We're a private institution, but we have especially uh, made it our, our mission to make certain that we were accessible and affordable to people. Two different agencies named as the top 20 best colleges in North Carolina. We were named as uh, one of the safest colleges in North Carolina. In fact, we ranked sixth in, in the whole state. And we were named uh, in the top 20 to educate to career ranking. We were the only private institution in North Carolina that was named to that. It talks about the scope of what we do. It talks about our commitment to our region, to our students, to the fact of helping them grow and develop into the kind of citizens that we want our students. We do it in an environment in which it is encouraging, it's empowering them, and it is basically preparing them to serve this region. That's what we're most proud about in terms of our best kept secrets. I will do the zinger in there. We've got to talk about agriculture. One out of six of our traditional students are ag majors, and uh, this is a really important role for our institution and our ability to collaborate with agriculture at the community college, or now actually with the middle and the high school uh, down in, in Mount Olive. Education, agriculture and education are two major areas, and we will always continue to lift those up. Thank you. What does the future look like for your institution? Start with Dr. Dunsmore, followed by Dr. Kerstetter, and then Dr. Walker. Um, I think the future is very bright, as I highlighted earlier. Um, the collaboration between our boards, uh, the collaboration with my two colleagues sitting next to us. Um, I, I just think where our kids are going, um, I wake up every day just wondering what they're going to do and what's next. Um, so I ranked a few things that I, that I Again, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but one of the things I tell people, the traditional schools you heard me say earlier, coming in, sitting in lines, reading, writing, arithmetic, going home with your books and studying, um, that's all changing. These, these kids are just going uh, way too fast for that. So I think our idea of what a school or an education is is radically changing. Uh, the other thing uh, with Wayne County Public Schools, as most of you are aware, we're entering into a building project, which I again thank our commissioners and Mr. Wood and helping us with that and bringing our buildings up to that level that can handle technology. We have two new middle schools that are ranked top in the, in the country for what they can do. And uh, these kids are just taking advantage of wonderful, wonderful things. And as you heard me say, it's that equity across the county. And uh, I'm a strategic planner. We went to them with our facilities plan, zero to five years, five to 10, and then 10 to 15. And, and you've heard these gentlemen say, we, we take very seriously about the future and what we're leaving behind us. Um, we went with them with a zero to five year plan. We're in our second year. We're already looking at where we need to be 10 to 15 years. And we're looking at growth and where the students are and what we need. And obviously what we put on paper may be obsolete tomorrow. So there's always that challenge with that. But in the immediate future, we're going to be starting some building projects that you'll see, as well as I mentioned before, the bring your own device program that you're going to start seeing kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, that we're going to accept and allow them to have those cell phones out and using them as part of their education and working with that. Um, we have a partnership with Dell that are working on us. Uh, part of our technology plan was to upgrade our teacher computers. Um, when I came here last year and, and my technology people, the machines sitting on our teachers' desks the average age was nine to 10 years. 
you heard him say, you know, two years is the shelf life on these. So I have teachers. So we're putting new units on every teacher's desk and working with Dell on those. And just the amount of curriculum information free that is out on the web that these teachers have access to that I need those high speed connections to to get on. And, and again, we have a lot of filters, a lot of protections, but there's just so much information out there that we can take advantage of. And then it's also educating our parents. And we're still gonna have books, but you know, you may not be able to need a book. There's a lot of things you might be able to look up on your computer, they just weren't aware how. And it wasn't the way they were trained, it wasn't the way I was trained. So I think there's a big radical shift coming in, in education that's gonna carry right up through the colleges. Uh, you, you folks out in the business world are gonna see a different student coming out the gates of what's coming on the horizon. I think the future is exciting. Um, we talked about the half-life of technology. Understand our challenge in education is that we're trying to prepare students for jobs that we don't even know exist. And they are gonna be developed over the next several years. And so the best thing that we can do is to make certain that they have the problem solving skills, the communication skills, critical thinking skills, the ability to work nicely in the sandbox with other people or independently, have a strong work ethic. If they have those things, they will migrate to wherever these opportunities are. And so one of the reasons that we are rooted in the liberal arts tradition is that's where those skills are developed and then the majors enhance those. As far as what's on our agenda for the future, we'll continue to grow. We're one of the few colleges uh, that have been experiencing consistent enrollment growth over the last several years. We're expanding our resources. Um, we are just about finished with a new track lacrosse complex. We're gonna start a new addition, an educational wing to our chapel, and we'll build new residence halls over the next couple of years. We expect to expand our fine arts program. We think that that really adds in a major quality of life to this region, which is very helpful when we're attracting business uh, to the region. And we will continue to expand our academic degrees, both seated and online, both the graduate and the undergraduate level. Thank you, Phil. Um, I would say for Wayne Community College, tactically what's immediately out in front of us is, is meeting the need for more skilled workers for our manufacturing sector here in Wayne County. And if you look at some of our data and compare us to some of our peer counties just adjacent to us, that, that has been shrinking in terms of percentages wise over the last few years. From a broader and much more strategic and long-term perspective, I think it's important that we be candid and, and acknowledge that, uh, at least for us at Wayne Community College, our, our, our mission is three-pronged. Uh, we are here to meet the educational, the training, and the cultural needs of our community. 23% of Wayne County's citizens live in poverty, which is 10% above the national average. Um, last, our, set, our unemployment rate in September was 5.4%. Now, most economists regard 4.5, 4.7% as full employment. So that suggests to me that we also have a good bit of people here who are working but are the working poor. So strategically, we also have to look at the colleges. Not only how do we educate those who are coming right out of K through 12, and how do we intervene in their lives, as you heard Dr. Dunsmore um, say, that, and this is not just his responsibility, this is our responsibility as a college. It's a failure on us to wait for them to get to the 11th grade to introduce them to careers that change to the trajectory of a family's life. And we are, we are training students out there that are leaving with two-year degrees making $70,000 and above. These are middle-class salaries. We have to address the culture of poverty. Education has been proven to be the route out of that, and we do it one family at a time. There was just an article in the News and Observer less than a week ago stating that in North Carolina, uh, if you were born poor, you're more likely than most states to stay poor. We don't have to accept that. And as educators, I think my colleagues agree with me. I am certain the student, faculty, and staff of Wayne Community College agree. And I think 
I'm in it for the long haul, and I think what it requires is not one institution, because we're talking about complex social challenges, but we're talking about everyone needing to sit down at the table to have some collective impact, because no one institution has all the resources necessary. But we certainly together have the human capital to address these issues. And I know that I'm in it for the long haul, and I know that the faculty and staff of Wayne Community College is in it for the long haul. Gentlemen, thank you. We're just proud of having you in Wayne County. Let's give them a round of applause. Well done, guys. You did a good job. Uh, I'd like to invite to the podium our wonderful chamber executive, Ms. Kate Daniels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, gentlemen. To quote uh, William Yeats, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And to say that these gentlemen um, and their great team that they work with day in and day out is doing just that in our community is a complete understatement. So thank you, each of you, for being here today and your great insight. Guys, we talk about this at every event. At every event, I feel like a broken record, but we talk about this community is different than any other community. Um, and it's based on collaboration and really strong leadership. So thank you for being here today. We're back on Wayne Goldsworth Television. Thanks for being with us. A quick reminder that this program airs Monday through Friday, beginning at 7 a.m. for the first segment, the first time. And then again, it repeats at noon. Then again, it re-repeats at 5.30 p.m. Okay? And this is the last time I'll be talking to you in 2016. Okay? Okay, 2016. Gee whiz, gone away. 2017, we'll be here talking to you in 2017, yeah, January something, January 2nd, I guess, right? Oh, by the way, Wayne County offices will be closed. Wayne County offices will be closed, the courts will be closed, the courthouse will be closed Monday, January 2nd. The landfill and convenience centers will also be closed, the Wayne County Public Library will be closed, the senior center will be closed on Monday. All Wayne County offices, City of Goldsboro offices will be closed Monday in observance of New Year's Day. A quick reminder that Tuesday, Tuesday the 3rd, the morning of the 3rd, will be the Wayne County Board of Commissioners meeting. And that's in the chamber, the uh, uh, commissioner's meeting room, the chambers, on the fourth floor of the Wayne County Courthouse with a briefing beginning at 8 o'clock and then the meeting itself will begin at 9 o'clock and you're invited to all of that and it's free, it's no charge. In fact, you go in, you sit down and you hear what commissioners are doing to run the business, make the business of the county. Things are happening. Things are really happening in Wayne County. You need to find out what's going on because some of it might affect you in one way or another. All right, Tuesday evening is the meeting of the Goldsboro City Council. They normally meet on Monday, but Monday's a holiday. All right, Monday's a holiday. So city council meets on Tuesday evening, and you're invited to that as well. Now remember that we also broadcast the commissioner's meeting on Ustream. So you can go to, the, go to WayneGov.com, WayneGov.com, and click on the link. Uh, during the meeting, you can see it live right there as it's happening. And the city council meeting, they meet and that uh, runs live on TV on Channel 10. Now here's the answer to today's trivia question before we get out of here. What U.S. state has the smallest population? And the answer to that trivia question is the state of Wyoming. Smallest population. That's it for today. Please take heed, drive, care, drive carefully, and if you're going to be partying, please party responsibly. And if you're going to be in, in, indulging, have a driver. Make plans. Think ahead. Do the right thing. Be careful. Take care of your family. And we'll be back in here next year. We'll be back Monday morning here on Wayne Goldsboro Television. Please have a great weekend. Drive carefully. Always wear your seatbelt. For Pat Garner, I'm Wayne Alley, and this is Wayne Goldsboro Television. <laughs>